Hello and welcome to the Post to Post podcast. It is number 34. My name's Neil. I'm here with Brent. Hello. And a special guest, Jason, is joining us. I don't know if you can see him. It's going to be a little small on your guys' screen, but uh, he's joining us via video and audio. Yeah. Uh, and this is February 3rd, by the way. I forgot to say that. And uh, so, yeah, this is our first experiment uh, through technology to bring in another person. And uh, what better person than Jason? Yeah. Because we're going to we're going to talk about some pretty juicy things here. Uh, including goaltender interference, including John Tavares, and including maple syrup. Because if you can see in the camera there, we have some maple syrup out there. And uh, we teased you guys a couple of weeks ago with some maple syrup talk in podcast number Whatever. 20 or yeah. something like that. I don't know what it was. I have a question, and you guys can probably answer this better than I can. Is there egos in the United States? Um, I think so. Is that just so. a Canadian thing? It's a uh, Kellogg's brand, egos. right? I think Kellogg's is is based in Michigan. I think so. I, yeah, I assume it's. I'm hoping so. I assume it's in the states. We'll find out quick enough. L- assuming it is in the states, and knowing how hard it is to get Canadian maple syrup, or maybe syrup. In, I've I've just looked it up. There are egos in the states. Hi, like what Americans? Please answer this. What do you guys eat on your egos, or you just eat them plain? Like, do you guys put syrup on your egos? Oh, yeah. Th- do you think they do? Oh. I... When I go to the U.S., which is fairly frequently, I go to the Walmart in Epping, New Hampshire, and there's all kinds of syrup there. There's there's the synthetic stuff, the Aunt Jemima and the Old Time, and, you know, there's various kinds of uh, maple syrup, tasting syrup. There's corn syrup, then there's real maple syrup. So, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, at, at least in New Hampshire there is. I don't know about Louisiana or Texas. I wonder, I wonder what the perception of syrup is, though, like, because they, they get the Aunt Jemima stuff that's not actual maple syrup. I wonder if they if they tried maple syrup, they wouldn't like pure 100% Canadian real ma- uh, maple syrup. I wonder if they tried that, they wouldn't like it because they're so used to the fake stuff. I, I don't know. What do you think, Jason? I don't know. We can't <laughs> comment. I'm not American. Uh, let us know down in the comments below. <laughs> uh, okay, so I, I don't think that we need to wait any longer than uh, let's just get into this goaltender interference thing because mm-hmm. it's... It's to the point, well, I mean, not now. It's to the point, like, last year, basically. It all started for me when Jason and I were sitting on my couch in my apartment in Fredericton watching the New York Rangers and the Montreal Canadiens, and Carey Price was literally drug out of the net, and they scored, and it was a goal. And you remember at the time, I said, they're going to call this a good goal, and I was just absolutely joking with yeah, you. Yeah, were, you were trolling me. And then when they called it a good goal, I just exploded in laughter. I could not believe it. Was, it. Uh, I've never seen a worse call in my life. And then this year happened. And there's been that, a call, a crappy call like that, what, like five to ten times already this year? It's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And, and we, could, we can debate about it here over the next 30 minutes or whatever. We can talk about it. We can have a discussion. But it just, to, just before we, we, we begin, just before we begin, that's the problem. The fact that we're sitting here talking about it and arguing about it is a perfect example of what's wrong with the rule. And it's not just us. This isn't uh, some hockey-crazed guy sitting on a Saturday afternoon talking about something that, that peeves them off. This is news right now. It was a main topic of discussion at the All-Star General Managers meeting mm-hmm. last weekend during the All-Star break. It's all over the CBC in Canadian media. There's news stories about it even again today. It's being talked about by the players in the dressing room, and it's happening every damn night still. And Bettman had to come out and make a statement. And the statement, I thought, would help solve things because Bettman, I think, issued the order that when they do these reviews from now on, they're to do the reviews in real time, not to super slow-mo them down to look for some tiny thing. Look at them in real time and make a quick decision. That's not what's been happening. At least when Toronto makes the phone call, that's not what's happening. Mm, it's like, I, I want to go, look, let's just go, let's talk about three specific plays. And Jason, I think you're familiar with all three. Mm-hmm. Um, the McDavid one against Calgary. Do you remember that one a couple of weeks mm-hmm. ago? Maybe a week ago? Mm-hmm. And he kind of came in and kind of did his little cu- cut in front of the net and kind of clipped him a little bit and the other guy put it in. Yeah, exactly. He, he mm-hmm. skated in front of the net, clipped the goalie a little bit. This was in overtime. It was 3-3 in overtime mm-hmm. against Calgary. And um, Calgary didn't have the opportunity to challenge for, for that to be goaltender interference because you can't in overtime. A challenge has to come from the Situation Room in Toronto in overtime. 
And that's what they did. They called in. They said that we're they're challenging. They're going to look at the goal. And then they called it back. Mm-hmm. Some people may have heard McDavid's comments after the game. Um, but the thing about it is, when the ref made the call at center ice, he didn't say, we've determined... Uh-oh. Screen went off. Uh, <laughs> he didn't say, we've determined um, that it was no no goal. He said, the situation room in Toronto has determined that there was no goal. Yeah. So that tells me that there's a, a confliction between Absolutely. The, the referees and the situation room. Mm-hmm. And that makes the NHL look so bad. It's just, I, I don't I don't get it. So there was that play and others which sparked the, which you mentioned, the meetings in for the, uh, that happened near the All-Star game. And then two nights ago, Boston played St. Louis and Winnipeg played Vegas. Two co- very controversial calls in that game. I want to talk about the Vegas Winnipeg one first. And Jason, did you see that one? The Hellebuck? Yeah. Yep. Hella mad. Hella mad. <laughs> yeah, he was he he was pissed. Mm-hmm. And he even said so after the game. Like you this right. is this is a guy so let's, let's talk common sense for a sec. If you break your stick over a top of the goaltender and then the goal goes in. Don't you think there's probably some form of goaltender interference there? I think... Uh, like, if you just take a whack and you break your stick over the goaltender's head, aren't you going to look at that and say common sense says, hey, you you broke your stick over that guy's head. He wasn't able to stop the puck there. I, I, I understand that argument, and I think I have the unpopular opinion here. I think that was a good call because... Really? Yeah. I, I'll tell you why. So the slash happened, and the refs missed the slash. Could have been... Could have been a, a penalty easy. Could have been five minutes. Like, it was, it's almost suspension worthy. He broke a stick over the guy's head. I think it was Sid said he'd give him two games. Yeah, like, it's, it. it's, yeah. it's crazy. So, d- the ref missed that slash to the head. Okay, it happens. They're human. And then the puck is sitting behind Hellebuck, and it goes in. I don't think that slash to the head stopped him from making the save, because the puck was already behind him. So, I think that's why it was called a good goal, because... It didn't prevent him from making the save because he didn't move prior or after. Like, it was already behind him. He thought he had it, so he wasn't moving anyway. And the, when the refs look back at the play, they saw the slash, and they're like, oh, crap, we missed a slash. But you can't review a penalty. Well, no, You but can't give a penalty on review. I but can you review it for goaltender interference? But the, I think that's the thing. It wasn't goaltender interference because it didn't prevent him from making the save. And if you if you listen to his comments after the game, he basically said, "I didn't throw my head back. I didn't dive. If yeah. I would have done those things, basically, I would have got the call. So maybe it, they need to start playing this more like soccer and faking injuries and and diving all over the place to get the calls they need." I so have this a question. Is, this is a huge problem. I have a question, and then I have a comment, depending on the answer to the question. <laughs> in some international hockey, maybe all international hockey, when the goalie gets hit in the mask with a puck, the play is automatically blown down. It's blown down. Yep. Now I don't know if that's only when he's hit with a puck or whether he's hit with anything else in the mask. I'm not sure. But if the rule is anything, and you apply that in this circumstance, regardless of whether it's goaltender interference or not, because I think it's more of a safety issue, the minute there's an impact on the goalie's mask, some strap could have broken, some padding could have jostled loose inside that mask, and the goalie, I think, is at risk for an increased opportunity for an injury. And Mm -hmm. I think you could make a rule that would blow the play dead the minute the goalie has any significant contact on his mask from any source, and then it's dead. I, I would be okay with that. I, I completely agree. It should have been a penalty. It should have been no goal based on the fact that he slashed him in the head, but they missed it. Mm. And I think that was the main issue. And if you look at the slashing penalty in general, if you slash someone and your stick breaks, or if you break their stick, it's an automatic penalty. Yeah. Automatic. So why is it different when you slash someone in in the freaking head like this is a guy's face and it broke his stick like that was just just an, an, an abysmal missed call mm-hmm. but I think it I think the the goal itself was good based on the fact that they couldn't review the penalty because you can't do it you can't review penalties so mm-hmm. I think I think unfortunately it should have never been a goal but I think based on the rules and the review I think it was a good call which is a problem but Anyways, uh, the next one that happened, and Jason, you, maybe you were watching this game because you're a Bruins fan. Mm-hmm. The two of them? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, this, like, this mm-hmm. has shades of the whole Carey Price thing from last year. And if you guys haven't seen these plays, you can go look them up. They're on YouTube. Um, Jake Allen was curled out of the net. 
by two Boston players. Uh-huh. And then they said, then I think Krejci shot the puck in the net after that. And Jake Allen was in the parking lot or somewhere. Like he wasn't the even. The best part of it was they were like, one of the guys was on his knees, I think. The other guy was just sliding. And Jake Allen was just being pushed out to the side and just turns his head and looks at the puck as <laughs> yeah. it goes in the net. It's absolutely ridiculous. He was, he was so confident that it was ridiculous and it wasn't going to be a goal that he did he didn't try because he knew he didn't have to because he knew it was going to be goaltender interference and then it was a goal <laughs> <clears throat> i know i i'm not a boston fan and i am a jake allen fan but here's how i see this i think 80 percent of the reason jake allen was moving from his right to his left is because he pushed he pushed right to left to try to cover the play and he pushed himself out of position and yes by then boston player had got in behind him and maybe continued that momentum but he wasn't going to get back and stop that puck anyway. No way. I think I I don't I disagree. You said see we we had a discussion about this on the Discord a couple of days ago. Remember, the way we read the rules, it wasn't whether the intent was to save; it was whether you were prevented from trying to move. Right. Right. So he definitely pushed from right to left, absolutely. And then the two guys came in barely behind him, and we have to determine whether or not he could have tried to push back to the right. And that's I guess where the call is made. And they must have obviously agreed with Brent there and said that no, he was already too far out of the net. But to me, that's not how I read the rule. And the rules are just terrible. Like, oh, just terrible. It's, it's, it is terrible. And did yeah. you see the, like, the situation room on NHL.com? And Tim had talked about this. They they put their decision afterwards online so you can read it. And it's garbage. It gar- was the most generic thing I've ever read in my life. It's garbage. It's absolute garbage. It tells you nothing. It's, it's basically the exact quote the ref gives on the PA system when he makes the call. Exactly. It, like, it literally tells you nothing. This is a problem, and it's Gary Bettman's problem. Oh, yeah. Because no he, question. He has to be the leader. He has to be the guy who who says, you know what? Let's make a change, and let's make it now because the trade deadline's coming up. These are important points. Mm-hmm. Like, you can't wait until March when the next meeting is. You need to have it now. And you definitely can't leave this unresolved when you start the playoffs. Oh, my God. You can't have playoff series decided in overtime on a cheap cheap ass call like that no way well we were talking about this at this time last year before mm. the playoffs and then look what happened with cam talbot and edmonton versus the ducks do you remember that play jason or, or mm-hmm. like yep that was ridiculous ryan kessler was like <laughs> trying to impregnate Grabbing right on to his bed. he was like he was yeah. he was in there <laughs> and that was a goal like <laughs> after that how are we still here talking about this? How are we still here with an even bigger issue? And it's gotten more complicated this year than it was last year. And mm-hmm. last year was ridiculous. It's so frustrating. Yeah. And this is all a reaction to 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, the whole Dallas Buffalo business, where it used to be if you even had the very end of one of the hairs on your whatever dangling over the borderline <laughs> of the crease, then they wave it off. And then they went totally the other way. Not only are you allowed to be in the crease, you can do almost anything in the crease as long as you don't offend this rule, whatever the rule is. Mm. No one seems to agree at, on that part. So now you can do almost anything, including uh, weaponizing your stick it's, and, and trying to decapitate a goalie. Like it, It's unbelievable. Like Kessler was molesting Talbot last year. <laughs> Didn't even take him to dinner first. It's, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. I, yeah. And I don't know, like, how do they change it mid-season drastically and look back at all the things that happened this year. Brendan Gallagher has a has an op, has a an idea. Does he? This will he be good. does. Yeah. Well, they, <laughs> I'm ready for this. They they went around the dressing room and asked players and probably many teams, but one of the quotes I'm aware of is uh, Brendan Gallagher's quote where he's asked what would you do differently and he said, "Well, from what I understand, in Toronto in that room, there are different people on a given night." He said, "One of the problems is that different people see those kinds of plays different ways, and it has to be the same person sitting in that room every day I agree. making consistent decisions. Now, I don't know how that room is staffed. He, he might. I don't. But if it is being staffed by, you know, they just roll dice or something to see who goes in there, then that's a big problem, and, and he might have be onto something there. I, I still go back to the idea I had last week of having five guys, or it doesn't have to be five, could be ten, could be I don't care how many it is, could be four hundred and seventy one people, however many people it takes to get the call right. You put them separately in their own room. So they can't talk to each other. They have to look at the rules, they have to look at what the call was on the ice, and they make the decision in their tiny little room with all their screens by themselves, with an NHL official sitting right next to them. Every, every single one of them has an NHL sitting, official sitting right next to them. They all make the decision, 
it all gets tallied up and it goes back to the game. Well, now Jason quoted the rule a while ago, and I think he spent some time talking about the rule. I'd nominate Jason to be the guy, and he can sit in Fredericton and do it. It doesn't have to be Toronto. Just have Heck Jason yeah. do it. I'd, or even a committee of us. Or maybe let everybody vote on the internet as to whether it's a goal or whether oh, it's we, not. We can never do that. No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> too, too many biased fans. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, yeah, I just, I don't know what else I'll say because, mm-hmm. like, every week. I like the idea we came up with where when they release. Basically, I think any time a call goes to the situation room, they should do what they do with, with player suspensions or whatever and release a video explaining why the call was made the way it was. I, I completely not, agree. Not this generic, well, because this happened, we got a good goal. That's basically what we got the other night. And I, I think it should be give us all the camera angles you have, break mm-hmm. it down, say this this happened here. He, we don't think he could have done this. Give us a reason why the call is being made the way it is. And I don't think they can do that. I think that's the point we're at right now. Yeah, they, 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 like financially, yeah, they're a billion dollar company. They could do that easy. They could hire someone to, to make the video and to narrate it and to explain it and stuff, but they can't. That's the problem. Even they, they don't, can't. They don't have it. the consistency to do it. Yeah. Because like, they'd be contradicting themselves every time they put a different video out. Yeah, it's like, it's unbelievable. Like, the NHL looks so bad right now with Golden Era Reference. I can't even, like, it's so frustrating. So in the All Star game, Bettman had his little speech and he basically said, I'm going to tell the refs to tone down the calls a little bit, right? Obviously, they went 180 and went completely the other way based on all the good goals we've had. So, do you obviously, think, they can't find the happy medium. Do you think like, that they you just think, can't? Do you think they're doing this on purpose to troll Batman? <laughs> no, I mean, like, I mean, seriously, not just not just for fun, but they're so frustrated. Like, they're probably as frustrated as we are because they're being told seven different things, maybe from different NHL officials including Gary Bettman. Mm-hmm. And they're just sick of it. So they're like, okay, well, we're going to do the complete opposite thing to know. prove a point. Now, according to what you said a while ago, Toronto can invoke some review in overtime and a coach cannot. That, that's right. But it looks like, you know, I know in some cases Toronto intervenes and says, you better look at this. But then the referees get the opportunity to look and they still make the decision. Here, by the by, the, the wording of that referee when he, mm-hmm. when he was done with the... Uh, um, McDavid goal and Strom got that rebound. He he, as you say, he outed Toronto. He said after you know Toronto did this video review, the call on the ice is mm-hmm. no goal, and he didn't even say it was his own call. You know he he just said no goal. So he's basically saying Toronto told me to say no goal. That, that's what he's really saying, right? From my understanding, Toronto has full control of whether it's a goal or not in overtime, or in the playoffs. Wow. Now, I can see Toronto intervening and saying, look, guys, you better look at this. Go over to the penalty box, uh, get the little iPad out and have a look, and then decide what you want to decide. Mm-hmm. But have a look and look at all the angles. We think there there might be a question here. And then leave it in the hands of the ref. I would probably be okay with that. I imagine Toronto's involved probably initially to help promote consistency. Yeah. <laughs> but we know where that went. Yeah, they're, they're part of the problem, if not mm-hmm. the main problem. So, What is your guys' opinion on that whole situation of him saying that? Because... I've heard a few times before where they've come off and said, you know, in whatever the word is, in talking with Toronto, we've come to this decision. But to my knowledge, that's the first time I've ever seen someone pass the buck and say, Toronto says this, this is what happened. Basically, to me, I got out of that, that the ref didn't agree with Toronto and there was a difference of opinion and he basically just passed the buck. Mm-hmm. That's what I got out completely. of it. Completely. He, uh, yeah. he, I think it was pretty obvious that he completely disagreed. Because usually they say in conjunction with Toronto or something like that, like you said. Yeah. And he just, he blamed it all on, on Toronto. And at the end of it all, he's the guy who's standing in the ice, and he's got the stripe on his arm, and he's the guy who does the wave-off symbol. So at the end of it all, regardless of who's really got the power, he's exercising the power. Mm-hmm. He is the one who ruled it no goal. And he's got a union that he belongs to, the NHL Officials Association, and I'm sure there's all kinds of backroom politics about how that oh, yes. that works and doesn't work, and there's probably a lot of strife about that so that might be some sort of attempt by him or the NHLOA Mm -hmm. to uh, pee on a fire hydrant here Mm -hmm. in this case and and put the blame where it really lies the only other option he'd have if they make him do a call he doesn't want to make is to skate off the ice and And be done he's not going to do that he's not going to do that 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 ends his career exactly so So what what an awful position to put that referee in only days after Bettman says we're going to fix this Oh, that was before. And the referees oh, okay. are so protected in the NHL. You don't ever hear anything about what goes into their job. Like, they're, mm. it's just hush-hush. So 
I, I agree with Brent. When you see something like this, the guy is clearly frustrated with what's happening. I think this is kind of a, a jab or an attempt to get things going. That's why I brought up, like, are the, are the refs trolling the NHL right now mm. and just toying with them and using what power they do have to cause problems? And I think it's like it's frustrating for us, but it's almost smart in a way yeah. because it's making the NHL look stupid. And they deserve to look stupid. What better way to, to promote changing the rule than to look stupid? Yeah, Learn I don't, from your mistakes. I don't know that the refs are doing that or that it's a, an organized approach, but if they are, I think I like it. I like it. Yeah, yeah, I have no problem with it. But Neil, do you remember like back in the spring before the podcast was out? We, I think we had a video where we talked about coaches' challenges and how there's too many coaches' challenges now. Oh yes. With all this going on, why would you not use a coach's challenge, regardless of what the play looks like? Because it seems like a shot in the dark 50-50 chance that you're going to get the call you want. Yeah, cause you, can, you can be confident on the bench that maybe, uh, okay, we, we scored a goal, but it, like that's or they scored a goal against us. Mm, they, it was probably a good goal. Let's not waste our, our challenge. But now, you, you just don't know. So, I mean, why not use it? You like, It's a risk, but... Hmm. Like, like in theory, let's take the Boston goal, for example. Let's say they called that a no, no goal on the ice, and then Bruce Cassidy challenges it. It doesn't look, obviously, like it's going to be a goal, but according to the Situation Room, that's a goal. Yes. It's... So, like, you could have won that. Like, it's unbelievable. I don't... Uh... Absolutely unbelievable. Like, 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 you guys were talking about Tim and Sid earlier. I think they mentioned this on the on the show, too. They basically said the winter meetings are coming up in March. And is this an issue that can wait until March to be addressed? Because I, it can't. How can, It can't. I agree. There's, there's no way. There's no way. You need to have this meeting this weekend or next weekend. This needs to be done now. You can't wait and, and put the fans and the teams. Like, these are huge points. These are unbelievable points. Can you imagine if Calgary missed the playoffs by one point because they lost that overtime game uh, due to – or, like, that was a bad example – any team that loses mm-hmm. a, a challenge in a game and then ends up losing the game, maybe because of the challenge or whatever, and misses the playoffs by one point, like this isn't just like a rare thing. This could happen. This is plausible. I can't. Like, like the fans are pissed because they don't understand. It seems like, and then the coaches are pissed because they don't understand. The players are pissed because they don't understand. Mm-hmm. And the owners have got to be pissed because let's say you're one of those teams that's that's in the hunt and you miss by, let's say, three points and three you had three bad calls go against you. Think of the revenue you're losing for potentially, potentially two or more home games in the playoffs. Oh, like, yeah. This is a huge issue for everybody, and it looks so bad on the league. And, and I agree. I think it looks so bad on Batman right now. It does. It's like we're talking about the 25 years of Batman, and then this is what you're dealing with for the last month is just bad, bad officiating. And it's been all over the media in the last couple of days, mainly due to the whole Jake Allen and Connor Hellebuck play the other night. And we have heard nothing from the NHL, not a peep on either situation other than that generic, ridiculous post on NHL.com. Mm-hmm. It's, I don't like. I don't know how they. I don't know how they sit there in the dark and not say something. Like it just makes them look worse. Why is Gary Bettman not doing an interview two days ago? Two o'clock in the morning after all those games. Like, that's his job. Be, be a leader, Gary Bettman. And I know it's your 25th anniversary in the league, and it's a huge milestone and stuff. Has he ever looked worse? <laughs> like when Well, does... a couple of uh, that season we lost, he didn't look very good in that. Okay, that's, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. But <sighs> he's not looking... He's not looking better year by year. He's not looking better to us, but he's looking just great to the owners. And that's all he that's the only group he works for is he, the owners of That's all he cares about. Of the NHL. He's a puppet. He's a money puppet. And you know, the first lockout didn't go well for him. It didn't go well for anybody. It was just a dud. But the last two lockouts have been favorable to the owners. In the first one they got the salary cap. Mm-hmm. In the second lockout they got escrow and they got a reduced sh- uh, player uh, revenue share. So Bettman's pulled that off. He's grown hockey in places where it shouldn't you know, normally grow, but it's growing mm-hmm. in like places like Vegas, which is awesome. And the owners are loving it. The, the TV deals are through the roof. Hockey, the NHL was worth $400 million when he took it over in 1993. And now it's almost $5 billion. Mm-hmm. So the people who employ Gary Bettman think the sun shines out of his orifice. <laughs> yes. Right now. Yeah. And I'm this, just with the last one, I think escrow went from 75% for the players down to 50 so they're giving up like a lot and the owners are getting a lot mm-hmm. like they're making m- literally millions yeah and billions like yeah. it's and and they can credit gary bettman i think for that or certainly he'd be quite happy to take the credit 
You mm-hmm. know, uh, yesterday we're we're doing this on February third, which is a Saturday. Yesterday was Groundhog Day. The groundhog came out and didn't see his shadow, and we have maybe six more years of Gary Bettman. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Gary Bettman is the Donald Trump of hockey. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> now we're getting somewhere. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know. Do you have anything else to say, Jason, on this goaltender interference thing? All right. So, okay, let's 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 theorize here. So, common sense, which we think we have, which we probably don't, but we think we have, <laughs> tells us that these plays shouldn't be happening the way they are. Obviously, the rule as it is right now is not written in a way where common sense can prevail. So my question to you guys would be, what can be done, or how do you think they should tackle this to try to improve the calls? Because right now, they've tried whatever they tried to start the season with didn't work. Batman came out at the All-Star break, said, tone it down. That completely went 180 the other way. So that they're not in the happy medium where they need to be. What do you guys think that they should do to, to kind of address this issue? I think uh, communication is the best thing. I think they start at the top, revamp the entire thing that they've got going on there who makes decisions in Toronto bring in a new team or re re-educate the team and make it public say do you think they should have a public face like someone in that office that we all know this guy is in charge of totally. calls and he is the one responsible like you know we have the the head of player safety that makes the calls should we have someone that that is publicly a public figure that this guy here is in is the head of this department, and he's going to answer to all these calls when there's controversy. I don't know if I, I don't know if like I agree in a way, but I don't know if I want someone like a singular person making the decision. I would like to have a singular person be the face of the department and be completely. Yeah, that's basically what I mean. He like, has a team that decides, and then he yeah. kind of answers publicly for it. And, and if like if they have meetings on the weekend, or if they have a big meeting coming up because of all the stuff going on, I want a time by time. Like sheet of what they talked about and what they learned. Like I, w- I want communication. I want to know what's going on. I don't want to be left in the dark because right and now. And we have to assume that that communication is going on right now. It's just going poorly. But that's the thing. No, we don't know. There's no way they're not talking about this right now, and I, it's getting nowhere. Like, look at look at what we're looking at over the last month. If we can say that there's no way that they're not talking about it, but <laughs> look at the goals. There's no way that that's a goal. Oh, that's a goal. Like, I do you trust them? I don't. They, I don't maybe, know. Maybe they're. I don't have the answer. Like I said, common sense is not that common, apparently, at least with the NHL. I don't know. Right now, if they sat in Toronto with a pair of dice and threw them up against the wall, they <laughs> would have just as good a chance of getting these calls right as they are right now. Mm-hmm. In my view, I don't know if you can do much right now other than the communications piece that you guys have talked about. What I think I would do in the long term is talk about a solution that I had um last weekend, I believe it was, which is go back almost all the way to the Buffalo-Dallas situation where I'd, you make the crease the goalie's castle. If he leaves his castle, you can hit him. If he stays in his castle, you can't touch him. And that's easier to work out in a replay than this, you know, was the goalie able to get back or what was he thinking? Um, you know, I don't like that we'd have to go back that way, but it can't be worse than this. There, might, there has to be a happy medium. There has to be. <clears throat> Anyways, I I, like it seems kind of archaic, but I think I think that's one of the situations that would be the players would adapt, right? Like I think they would get used to it, and I think the goaltender would realize, hey, I can't go out there right now. Like mm-hmm. I get absolutely clobbered. I got to let them play that pocket. You know, maybe it would increase offense. Like I don't know, but I don't clearly either. what they yeah. have right now is is not working. It's not working. It's not working. No, it's not working. Um, and goalies are getting hurt or potentially hurt, like Hellebuck. You know, he could have gotten seriously hurt there. What if he did throw his head back? Do you think that would have been no goal? No goal, absolutely. No goal, yeah. And he, he's uh, right. We should not be encouraging flopping and faking it. And he, he's, so, right, he's right. He's right. If he had have embellished that, it would have, there would have been a call his way. Mm-hmm. And, like, it's so frustrating. It is. Um, well, let's put that topic to rest for now. We can bring it up. I'm next sure week. we'll I should talk about it again next week. Yeah, we can talk about it next week when there's 17 <laughs> other yeah, more examples to work week. on. <laughs> uh, I just want to talk briefly about the streaks in the NHL. Uh, for winning streaks, Toronto's on a four-game winning streak. They have not let in a goal in, I think, seven periods, something like that. They they had uh, two young defensemen play really well for them the other night, McDermott and someone else. I can't remember his name. Uh, they each got their own first goal, I believe, in the, in the same game. Uh, so they're on a four-game winning streak. And that puts a 15-point differential between third place in the Atlantic and fourth place in the Atlantic. So basically, Tampa, Boston, and Toronto have all solidified their position in the Atlantic Division, and it's the beginning of February. 
Mm-hmm. Like, I can't remember the last time, if any time, that that's happened before. The next closest team to Toronto right now in the Atlantic is Detroit, Detroit. and they're 15 points back. Yeah, they got 50 points or something like that. Yeah. It's unbelievable. <clears throat> anyway, uh, Pittsburgh is hot right now. Sidney Crosby is hot right now. They're on a four-game winning streak. Minnesota's on a two-game winning streak. They took down Vegas the other night. I think it was like four to one. Uh, New Jersey's on a two-game winning streak. Detroit's on a two-game winning streak. Florida's on a two-game winning streak. And Vancouver is on a two-game winning streak. And then on the losing side, we've got uh, Philadelphia on a three-game losing streak. Montreal on a three-game losing streak. Calgary with a two-game losing streak, but I believe it's actually five. It's two technically, but it's five because they went into overtime a couple times. But uh, the Islanders with two, Buffalo with two, and Arizona with two. So not not some surprises there at the end. Calgary's actually six, lost six in a oh, row. Oh, six in a row? Yeah. Yeah, I knew it was, I knew it was close to five, but mm. yeah. Uh, Jason, did you hear about the fine today? Mm, actually, I did not. Uh, TJ Oshie was fined five thousand dollars for cross-checking Latang in last oh, night's game. Wow! I did not see it. I did not see the play. I looked hard and I could not find it, but I did see a description on TSN. Uh, they both went into the boards. They both went down, and Latang was on was underneath, and Oshie was on top, and he he went down on him a couple of times. Ah. Got him with, neck, with the right? stick, yeah, with the cross-check mm-hmm. from behind, mm-hmm. and then Latang got up and they roughed him up a bit, so they each took a two-minute uh, minor at the time, but Oshie got the uh, the fine later. So hmm. yep. Interesting, okay. Um, I want to tell a little story, and this is this is a story that frustrates me about as much as goaltender interference. NHL online shop. Have you ever gone on NHL.com and looked at their products or tried to buy something? Nope. I think, Jason, you did at one point because you were looking for a Boston hat. Maybe yeah. last year. The shipping costs are quite something from the NHL shop. So the NHL had come out with these T-shirts, uh, hockey is for everyone, with the pride colors for the logos of the teams and stuff. They're pretty cool. I think that's important. So I, I wanted to get one. There was a New Jersey one there that I that I liked. Uh, I think it sends the right message, and I'd be happy to wear it on the on the channel. So it's twenty seven dollars. I said okay, and that's that's for a good cause. That's that's fine. Added to the cart, twenty seven dollars Canadian. And it said, free shipping over $20, I think, or something like that. Use promo code, whatever. So I used the promo code, and shipping went from $14 to $9. I'm like, what? Huh. Wait, <laughs> what do you mean? You can't say free shipping for over $20 and then put it discounted shipping. Like, free shipping is free shipping. Free shipping isn't discounted shipping. <laughs> so anyways, I read the fine print. Does not include any Adidas merchandise. Does not include any, like, non-clearance merchandise. So it was, like, only clearance stuff or whatever. So it ended up being $48 Canadian after shipping, tax, duties, or customs or whatever, and then the product. $48 for a T-shirt. That's ridiculous. It's insane. So I didn't buy it because I know the T-shirts are going to be available somewhere else, probably on lids or somewhere else Mm -hmm. where there's – <clears throat> way cheaper shipping and free pickup in store mm-hmm. I just I I don't think I'd, I would ever buy anything from NHL.com based on the fact that their shipping is ridiculous and I just don't like it just don't like it would you guys like would you guys have <laughs> bought that t-shirt not a nope. chance not a chance no no um, I don't know I, I it's understand. hard to justify that when you look at all the other deals you get yeah exactly I mean, the jersey right there was $19. <laughs> yeah. And the, that teacher was $48. Like, it's crazy. Now, I would understand if NHL.com was the only place to get hockey merchandise. So Sportcheck didn't exist. Pro Hockey Life didn't exist. Liz didn't exist. All these other places didn't exist. And NHL.com was the only place to get your hockey stuff. Well, you got to play it. You, get, you have to pay that. If you want the stuff, you have to pay it. But that's not the case. You can get the stuff uh, mm-hmm. other places. So... The people who shop at NHL.com, I guess maybe it's a little harder in the States because they don't have the availability of the lids uh, inventory that we do because there's more hockey stuff up there. I think you had told me it was around Christmas time. We were out shopping, Mm -hmm. and we found a popcorn, or you found a popcorn popper. It was a Stanley Cup, and it made popcorn. And in this store we were at, it was just a local, I think a pharmacy-type store. It was Shoppers Drug Mart. No, it was was Giant Tiger. Giant Tiger. And it was whatever the price was. It was $49. It was a Stanley Cup. Like, it was yeah. big. It was, like, this tall. Mm-hmm. And, but it was a popcorn maker. But you had seen the same popcorn maker on NHL.com, yeah. right? Yeah. It was, and like how much $300 was $300 or something. Insane. 
Like I couldn't believe it. It was, and it was the same thing. Like it, it was the exact same. This thing. was you know had the logo, the trademark. Yep. You know registered NHL official little mm-hmm. hologram thing or whatever. So like, it was a real deal. It wasn't a knockoff from uh, you know where. Wow. I am obsessive, literally obsessive about finding deals online. I check sites 20 to 30 times a day. That's how I got that jersey for $19, that jersey for $48, that jersey's for $70, that jersey for $40, this jersey for $40. Like, I only buy things if I get a deal. I have never found a deal on NHL.com, and I'm obsessed with finding deals. I've never found an, a deal on NHL.com that I've ever seen worthy enough to buy, other than in 2010 when I found a jersey, an Islander's jersey, for $29. And I paid like the twenty dollars shipping. So, anyways, other than that, so if you, if you're in the states and you shop for stuff and you can't find it on lids.com and you don't want to shop on nhl.com, where do you buy your stuff? I'm curious. So please let me know down in the comments. Hmm. I'll leave it at that. Boom. Okay, I would like to talk about John Tavares next. If you guys are okay with that. Sure. And I don't know if you guys have heard, but apparently, in two weeks' time. He and the Islanders are going to meet and have a discussion about his future with the team. He's going to ask hard questions about the arena, the goaltender situation, the plan for the future. They're going to ask him if he wants to stay, yada, yada, yada. What do you guys think he does? Do you think he stays or do you think he goes? Jason? I think he stays because that's what NHL players seem to do. When's the last time we had a blockbuster guy leave the team and go somewhere else? It's been a long time. He's a pretty loyal guy. I think all hockey guys tend to be loyal guys. Like I thought when Stamkos was considering leaving, I thought that was going to be the first time we were going to see it, and then he took a deal and stayed there. So I, I, th- I think I would like to see a move. Honestly, like I'm sorry, Islanders fans, because I, I'm, I won't even get into that actually. But I just don't think he's going to. I think he's gonna. I think the ownership and the management is going to listen to him, and they're going to basically agree to things, and he's going to stay. I think he's going to want to stay, but. Hockey is unlike, I think, any other sport. If you're a, a young kid, a mate, you might dream about winning the Super Bowl or the World Series or the NBA title. But when you're a young kid that dreams about hockey, you dream about one thing only. Mm-hmm. And I think most hockey <clears throat> players that grow up in the North American culture dreaming about that Stanley Cup will take a discount if it increases their chance to win it. And I think John Tavares stays only if the Islanders are able to persuade him that they're going to do not for him, but for the rest of the team, the things they need to do to be competitive. Mm -hmm. Oh, totally. And if they can't, you know, I don't think it's about his own money. He's probably going to get a massive amount of money no matter where he plays. So I don't think that's going to be the issue. Uh, It'll be entirely what they're going to do to make the Islanders a championship team again, because they were in the past. If they sign him, I'd... I don't know how they build the team around him because, like, I looked at their cap. So this summer, they have to sign Kuhlman, or sorry, not, they don't have to sign. They have to make decisions on Kuhlman, Bailey, Nelson, uh, Chimera, Prince, Johnston, Quinn, DeHaan, Hickey, Seidenberg, Pulak, and Halak, and Tavares. That's a lot of people to make decisions about. Now, I've gone ahead and looked at what they were making this year, and I've subtracted it from the cap and what cap they currently have. And they have, uh, in the summer, they have $31 million to use. $31 million, that's a lot of money. $31 million can sign you a lot of people. So I took the conservative approach and I I went through the list of people who I thought that they would sign. So Tavares, I said 10 million. And I think that's a pretty conservative. That's quite conservative. That's a little low. Like he could get 12 probably. Yeah. So, but we'll just, just, just for a hypothetical, we'll keep him at 10. They need another goalie. Uh, Thomas Grice, like, Tavares isn't going to sign if, 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 if Grice is the plan for the future. So they need another goalie. I put that at $5 million. I don't know who that's going to be, but they need to bring someone else in because chances are Halak's not going to resign, and he's not the goalie. Anyway, so I put the goalie at $5 million. Nelson, I said 3 because I, I these are all conservative. Nelson, 3 Prince, $1 million. DeHaan, $4 million. Hickey, $3 million. Uh, Seidenberg, one million, and that's just some of the players. I, I don't know if you were adding it up in your head, but that's twenty-seven million dollars, and that's conservative, very conservative, yeah, very, yep. very, very, very conservative. That means you have three million dollars left to sign six guys, including Bailey. 
Mm -hmm. Three million to sign six guys. So if you if you don't sign Bailey and you let him walk, that's a huge loss. You still need to sign five other guys. There's no way you're signing five other guys for three million. And this is conservative. If Tavares gets twelve instead of ten, that three goes to one. Like, I don't see how they sign if they can't sign all these players and they have to get rid of them, well, their team is going to be half minor, half half AHL players because they can't afford any other NHL players. I don't know how they're going to do it. I I really don't. It's 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 um, like I didn't know that they were in this situation until I looked at their cap a little bit a little bit more. But I just I don't think they can if they sign Tavares. I don't think they can sign anyone else of substance. I think he goes. And mm. I think he knows that. It's almost like they're in the Boston situation where the cap was terrible and now half of our team is rookies that aren't getting paid anything. Yeah. It, luckily for us, it's working out, but it, it, it's kind of the situation they're going to be in, it seems like. And, and Boston struggled the last three years other than this year. I mean, mm-hmm. they missed the playoffs three years in a row, I think, other than last year, the year before that they missed, and the year before that they missed. Mm-hmm. And I think the year before that they might even have missed, but it's... I don't like. I'm trying to think about teams of where he goes, and I'm wondering if he doesn't choose Colorado, if he's choosing places because he's not going to go to Detroit. They had, they don't have the cap. He's yeah, not going to go to Chicago. They don't have the cap. He's not going to go to Toronto. I, he's not going to Toronto. If you guys think he's going to Toronto, he's not. There's no way. No way. There's there's no way that they can sign him financially, and also the fact they can't afford him. Yeah, because all their money's going to this Marlo, guy. Yeah. <laughs> but they can't. Aff- they even money aside. Is Tavares going to want to go in there and compete with uh, Matthews for number one spot in center? I don't know if Matthews he cares is, about that. Does he care about that? Well, is, does Matthews? Matthews isn't going to want to play second role center to John Tavares, is I th- he? I think they want silver, and I don't give a, I don't think they give a darn whether they're on the first or second oh, line. There's no I, way they can afford him anyway. So. No, they can't afford him. So I, yeah, it's, it's, an over, it's a conversation that doesn't go anywhere. But So like, the conversation of him going to a contender, it's tough because of the money. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering that like Colorado has the the lowest league average of age, which is 25. That's the average age on, on Colorado. It's the lowest in the league. They're tied with Columbus. I'm wondering if he doesn't look at Nathan McKinnon and be like, I, I think I want to play with McKinnon. And there's so many other young guys coming up in Colorado. They need a goaltender. If they get a goaltender, like a, a, a solid, consistent goaltender, Bernier's not the long-term option. If they get a young, solid goaltender, not like young, but you know, a good, mm-hmm. a good goaltender, with the young guys they have on the team and McKinnon, I think John Tavares slots him pretty nice in Colorado. Mm. And I, I'm not saying John Tavares leaves. I still probably think he stays, like you guys said. I think he probably does stay in the in the Islanders, and, and the Islanders make tough decisions on other players. But if he goes somewhere, I'm wondering if Colorado wouldn't be the option. And everyone's talking about him going to Montreal. He's not going to Montreal. Montreal is a cesspool of failure and media and pressure <laughs> he's not going to montreal there's no way you're Be- getting you're getting jason excited here <laughs> uh, i love it when you say that <laughs> music to my ears boys you, yeah you must be pretty excited to uh to see montreal doing so poorly this year and boston doing so well well like when i remember when you got me to make that predictions video i had boston so yeah. i'm just completely shocked i can't get over it but <laughs> Um, the, the one thing I get about the Tavares situation is how pissed would that fan base be if he walks and they get nothing for him, right? Oh. Because the owners already came out and said that they're not going to be trading him. So he must think that there's a reasonable chance that they're going to resign him. I, I can't imagine that they would just let him go for nothing. It would be huge. Tell me this. Do the Islanders trade him before the trade deadline to a contender like Washington or Pittsburgh or Vegas or someone else, do they trade him, let him go to free agency, and then sign him back? So that they, they trade him, they get a, an absolute boatload of of players back and picks and whatever, and then they get Tavares back anyway via free agency. Do you think they'd do that? Do you think they'd let him, they'd trust him to come back? Or do you think Tavares wouldn't do that because he's a credible guy and he wouldn't want to... They, they've already come out on record saying that they're not going to do that. Oh, but yeah. so I, he, I could see the, the definitely the potential for doing that. Absolutely. Yeah, and Garth Snow is a good guy. But I thought Mark Bergerman was a good guy too. And he said he wouldn't <laughs> that's, trade... That's true. He wouldn't said he wouldn't trade 
two bands and look what happened. So I don't know. I really don't know. It just know. seems to me that hockey guys are just too loyal. It, it just like what about Doughty? I just, I just, I just can't see it. What about Doughty? He said he'll go wherever, whoever and wants that's to pay him. Interesting. That's and, very interesting. And Carlson basically the Doughty, said the same the thing. The Doughty and Carlson situation. Yeah. It's gonna be, it's gonna be wild. Mm-hmm. And then we have Tyler Sagan coming up, at this time next year. We'll have you having the same conversation, about him that we're having now about Tavares. Well, and Everly next year too, right? No, he's time for the next three years, I think. <clears throat> or two years. Two. But. No, well, one more year after this year. I mean, yeah, but I mean, <laughs> Everly is not getting what the money he's getting now. Hmm. But Tyler Sagan is going to cash in big time. He's making six right now, I believe. 5.5 or six. And he's going to get at least, I would say at least 10. I don't, I don't, I don't see how you give to Sagan any less than 10. But anyways, that's, that's Dallas's problem. <laughs> they're, they're not worried about that right now. So. <laughs> I don't know. That's uh, that's all I got. Well, I I endorse your opinion on Montreal not being a reasonable destination for him, and for both reasons. I think maybe six weeks ago or two months ago, I would have taken a deal that would bring Tavares to Montreal because I think the season was worth saving back then and could have been saved. Now I don't think it can. So why would a team that's not in the hunt try to get a rental that they maybe couldn't lock on to for next year? So I... I don't think that's in the cards. I still think, I, I don't believe the Islanders for one minute when they say they won't trade him. I think that they'll do what they need to do to make their team better. And if they can get a lot of assets for him, even on a short-term basis, to a, a team even like a St. Louis, who's done it the other way when you know when mm-hmm. they lost a player to, <laughs> in the same way. Um, I, th- I think that uh, he could go, but... I think what what plagues a lot of teams can't be fixed with one guy, and uh, I well, think that limits his market. When I said that Tavares was going to go to Montreal, I didn't mean in the at the before the trade deadline, via trade. I meant in the off season. In the in the full blown. Yeah. But I mean, Tavares would be the perfect fit in Montreal. Yep. They need a centerman. Mm-hmm. He like he there would there's no other player in the league that would be a better fit in Montreal than John Tavares. And they can afford him. And they can afford him, and that's the, but 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 for John Tavares' sake, mm-hmm. buddy, don't go to Montreal. But he'd have a better chance of winning a Stanley Cup in Montreal than he would if he stayed in New York. If it's about that, if it's about winning some silverware. I, I would agree with that, even though Montreal's in a pretty crappy spot right now. I, they, have, they have more assets in place. Yeah, and if they show Carey Price that they care enough about the offensive side of the Montreal Canadiens to get a Tavares in there to play with a Drew and Gallagher and some of these other players that are going to be around, you, know, you never know. Montreal's probably a playoff contender again. They might not mm-hmm. go very deep, but that they, I think that puts them back into contention. Uh, but and We can eliminate teams. Like, I think mm-hmm. you can eliminate Toronto. I think yeah. you can eliminate Detroit. I think you can eliminate Nashville because they're too deep in the middle already. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chicago can't afford them. I don't think L.A. can afford them. Otto, <laughs> Melnick's not going to pay Tavares. Ottawa's so, got enough problems of their own right now. Yeah, I mean, you could probably eliminate between fifteen and twenty teams off the list. I think so. But I mean, it's a it's a conversation that maybe we shouldn't be having because he's a loyal guy and he'll probably stay. But it's just for fun, I guess. But. Well, us talking about John Tavares is like a bunch of fleas arguing over who owns the dog, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> John Tavares <laughs> does not care what we think. No, John. No, he does not. No. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So uh, speaking of Montreal, real quick, do you guys think by the time the season starts next year, patrick has gone? Oh, one hundred percent. Yep, he gone. One hundred percent. He gone. Yeah. He might be gone before the next podcast. Yeah, he, he might be. <laughs> I I read online from a not credible source whatsoever that Montreal is prepping an absolutely massive deal to land John Tavares before the trade deadline, like a massive deal. If it goes hand in glove with the contract extension and all that that he'd sign right away, can which, they do, can they do that? Which right I now? think they can. Oh yeah. If they own, no one else can talk to him except the team that owns right. him prior to July first. Yeah. But the team that owns him can talk to him for for the long term. Sure. Once they got him, it's tough. Mm, I'd I'd be okay with that. But but if it helped us get rid of some problems too. Pacioretty and so forth. Pacioretty is from the that area, uh, if we're talking Islanders again. He's from, what, Connecticut, isn't it, originally? Yeah, something like that, yeah. Yeah, and, he, and he, he thrives when he plays down there. He likes it down there. He's an American. 
uh, that would be a nice fit, actually, because the Islanders aren't going anywhere this year. I think. Uh, neither, yeah, I think neither I think, Montreal. And yeah, I think Patch Ready leaves. I don't. His time's done. His time is done in Montreal. I think everyone has that same opinion. Probably Patch Ready himself. I hope he goes to St. Louis because I really want Cairo. Oh yeah. <laughs> because I don't know if you watched any juniors, Jason. Did you? No. Did you notice Cairo at all? Okay. Uh, no. He was incredible. So mm-hmm. I, I like him. So St. <laughs> Louis, if you could send him my way or the Canadians' way for Patrick, that'd be great. Thanks. <laughs> Get rid right on that. Yeah. So Jason, I have a question for you. Uh oh. Boston Bruins. After your preseason prediction and where they are now, they're going to make the playoffs. How much faith do you have in the team in the playoffs this year? Uh, still low. So if they end they're, up, they are absolutely overachieving right now, one hundred percent. So if they end up playing Toronto, which it looks like they will, who wins that series? Who? That's a tough one. I think it's tough because Toronto is so inconsistently terrible at defense. That doesn't make sense, but you know, you know what I mean. Like, I think it would be a really close series again. I think it would be yeah. a nail biter. For it, real. It would I be, think it'd be really good to watch. Yeah, it would be. It would be a That'd great. It'd be series. so much fun to watch that series. Who would you cheer for? Me? Yeah. I. I. I would cheer for Boston. Really? I yeah. would cheer for Boston. I would. I can't help myself. It's it's I'm born that way. What, that doesn't make sense. But here's here's the thing. It, it'd be a, <laughs> there, there, there's a thing. There's a but here. It's fifty one forty nine. I would cheer for Boston, but if Toronto won, I would be okay. Yeah, but why would you cheer for Boston? Because you don't even have a good reason. Well, no, I don't need one. See, that's the thing. I don't need one. I certainly don't have good reason to cheer for Montreal. Yeah, you do. You were born there. Well, okay. I guess that's a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> but I cheer for Toronto hard. Really? Yep, big time. The, the visual of a man wearing a Canadian's hat and sweater saying he would cheer for Boston has made my day, boy. It's yeah. absolutely well, awesome. The alternative is cheering for Toronto, which for me is even a harder religious walk through the wilderness. Frankly, uh, I, don't know. I, I honestly do hope Toronto does well this year. I can't root for them. I just can't. But my intellectual side, not my heart, but my mind, hopes that they do well. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't be all that disappointed if they went all the way. And I'm not even going to jinx them by saying the trophy that they're after. But uh, I'll do it Stanley Cup. Oh, man. <laughs> now you've gone and done it. Toronto, when you follow to the playoffs to the Boston Bruins in overtime in Game 7, you can blame this guy right over here <laughs> You're with the Vegas shirt and the Tampa Bay hat on. That's who, right. Who <laughs> thinks that you guys are good. <laughs> well, yeah, but I also said that I'm cheering for them. So Yeah, well, I don't know if that's good enough. I'm cheering for them in that series. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that uh, Boston has one more push that, that they can make. I, I think we well, got Chara getting older. You've got... Bergeron not getting any younger. I think Boston is facing uh, a downward slide just due to age, and they've got some great talent coming up. You've got your McAvoys and people like that, and I think they're going to still be competitive, but I think Boston's best days might just be behind it for now, and I think they have one more shot. Okay. Jason, how do you feel about DeBrusque? Uh, I don't know, he's looked actually. Pretty, he's looked pretty great at times, but he's been a little inconsistent. I mm-hmm. think he's one of their best young players for sure. It's but, like when we get talking to people in the Discord about uh, my favorite number eighty-eight. They, they they talk about how great he is, but I just find he's such a defensive liability that he scares me. Like, like I understand that line is is doing really well right now, mm-hmm. and it's for a while it was considered one of the best lines in hockey. But every time he has the puck, I, I'm, I I'll be watching the game with that. I'll just be like, watch this. He's going to turn it over. And, he, and 90% of the time he does. Yeah. So he does, he does magic with the puck, but then he just mm-hmm. tries to get too cute sometimes. You know what I mean? And yeah, totally. That kind of stuff, that stuff will kill you in the playoffs. So I, I'm definitely nervous about that. Hmm. Who's your favorite player on Boston right now? Oh, my favorite player has never changed. Well, I mean, outside of Bergeron. Bergeron. Mm. Uh, that's a good question, actually. I don't know. I'm I'm actually liking what McAvoy's doing. Do you think he's a defensive liability? Um, I think he's learning still. He's got a lot to learn. He's, I think he's still young. I think the first half of the year, or maybe not first half, first twenty five percent was questionable. This last thirty or forty percent has been really great. Mm-hmm. He's played some really, really strong hockey for sure. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why I, I like, in my sentimentality, to see Boston do well is the story of Charlie McAvoy. 
local boy, played college hockey there, yeah. gets picked up by the Bruins, does well, very late last season, catches on. He's a bit of a firebrand. Uh, he draws a lot of attention, and he's a very skilled player. And I think it'd be a wonderful story if he went far. Yeah, totally. So I like that. I, I don't. I, I, I can see Boston changing a lot just based on Chara leaving soon. Like how, Jason, how long? How much longer do you think Chara actually is going to play? Mm, I don't know. I was at the start of the season. I was hoping for sure he'd be gone after this year. Like a lot of Boston fans have just been waiting, but he's actually done okay this year. So he's been pretty if he solid. Si- if he signs, if he signs like a much cheaper contract, I'm totally okay with keeping him on. But if if he wants a lot of money, then I think that. I don't know. I, to me, that hinders the team, I think. But. What's he getting paid right now? Uh, it's up there. Mm, I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, it's four, high, though. Four million. Oh, I thought it was higher than that. Is yeah, that his cap hit is four, or is yeah. that just what he's getting paid? That's his, yeah, it's four. Four million. Oh, that's lower than I thought it was, actually. So, I mean, if they re-sign him, he's probably going to get three, maybe. I'd be okay with that. Yeah. I. I wonder... I, I wonder. I, I kind of just want Bergeron to be the captain of the team. <laughs> that's that's it, part of it too. It's, it's time, right? Is it not time mm-hmm. for him to be captain? Come on, it's like, how... to me. Like I'm, I'm a Boston fan and I'm a Bergeron fan, but he seems to me like to be one of like if you had like the top whatever mm-hmm. most respected players in the league, I would think he would be pretty high up on that list. Oh, absolutely. Him and Zetterberg, and uh, oh man, there's 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 a couple of, of real solid human beings in the in the NHL. Let me ask you this, though. Who was your least favorite player on Boston? At the start of the season, I was ready to shit Marshan out. Oh. Believe it or not. And then, actually, it was the start of last season before he had that big Olympic break. To me, Marshan has been much better ever since he got that chance to play in Team Canada. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I completely agree, yeah. Like, he just has. Like, I don't know if it was just a confidence thing or whatever. And he cut the crap out. He'd be an awesome hockey player. And any team would want to have him. But for some reason, he just has to keep crossing that line. So, but I'm, I'm much, I'm much better with Marshawn now. He was, he was definitely high on my list of I want to ship this guy out though. A couple years ago. How do you feel about Kudobin? Uh, he has his days. Because he was hot, 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 hot at the beginning of the year, and he still plays it's well. It's like when we had Subban. Subban played terribly for us. He goes to oh, Vegas yeah. and look at that. So that's mm-hmm. crazy. I have two kind of off-topic questions for you guys, kind of, though. Bring cool. it. Hit us with it. Do you, do you guys think, I don't know, this is, do you find stigmas from, like, teams in the past are still there for you today? Like, when you think of Philadelphia, do you think of, like, Philadelphia 10 years ago and project that onto the team now? Or, like, when like for Brent, do you think of, like, Boston Bruins 10, 15 years ago? Do you project that onto the team now, like, when you think, or do you stay with the times and kind of update your stereotype of what the team is? Uh, no, I, I think about it the way I thought about them in the past, and it's not 10 or 15 years, it's more like 30. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in, a, in a video that hasn't aired yet, Neil and I opened uh, in a mail time a fantastic box from, from a guy named Murray in Alberta, and in that box uh, was a bunch of um, hockey cards from the 70s era, of the Boston Bruins and some of these names that just came flooding back to me, you know, the Johnny Busick's and Wayne, and Cashman. Wayne Cashman and Phil Esposito <laughs> and people like that. And it just took me right back. And weirdly, when I think about Boston, that's what I think about. I think about Don Cherry behind the mm-hmm. bench and I think about Mike Milbury beating people with shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and I, th- and same thing with Philadelphia, you know, the Broad Street Bullies as they were known in the seventies, I still think of them as trying to promote that rough and tumble and it comes and it goes. Scott Hartnell left. Scott Hartnell was the was the guy who delivered that rough and tumble for many years, and he's now he's now gone. But uh, Philadelphia still has that that vision in my mind. To answer your question, uh, Jason, like every now and then, your friend Neil Jack Edwards will talk about the big bad Bruins. He'll just make a comment about it, and hey, there's there is no big bad Bruins anymore. It's yeah. a bunch of speedy little new kids, right? Like Bruins are com- that that time is gone. Your Bruins are a completely different team. They are. Yeah. And I, that's an interesting question because before I started this channel, I would have said, yeah, absolutely. Like, absolutely, I would have thought about Philadelphia fans being garbage people. <laughs> yeah, this... And now that I've started the channel and really t- I took a step back and realized that that was a ridiculous opinion, got to meet so many wonderful, incredible Philadelphia Flyers fans mm-hmm. and beca- because of this channel. And I've done that with all kinds of teams. You did taking my opinions of teams before I started this channel 
And taking a step back, I don't hate any teams anymore. Like there's mm. not a team out there that I hate because I, my love for hockey has grown and my hatred for certain teams has, mm-hmm. has diminished. And that's actually a good segue to my second question, which I had written down on this piece of paper. Do you think rivalries are less of a thing now? Oh, I think. Um, I mean, like you'll get the you'll get the NBC Wednesday night rivalry between Buffalo and Arizona. Like, get stoked for it. Like, well, I, that's not a rivalry. I, I, I yeah, I completely agree. I want to use Boston. I know we just talked about Boston Montreal, but I want to talk about them again because they just played each other three times in eight days. Mm-hmm. What do you remember from those games? Montreal no, lost all three games. I mean, outside of that, <laughs> do you remember any like crazy, amazing games with hard hits or an amazing? Like goals, like there's no talking points from those three games. It's like the rivalry was never even there. When's the last time that Montreal played Boston like back to back like that, and it wasn't like okay, I need to see this game. I didn't feel like that this year. You know, my biggest memory from that stand is Chara's slap shot, dropping. Oh, Dano. Uh, Matthew Dano or Philip Dano. <laughs> yeah. And Chara going over and checking on him and staying on the ice. And like, mm-hmm. I actually, <laughs> I that, never thought I'd say this, but I remember Chara for a touching moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that, I mean, that has nothing but, to do with rivalry. Uh, well, exactly. And, and maybe that is, goes to Jason's question. You know, when, when these rivalries change their dimension or they, or they, they disappear altogether, mm-hmm. it may be, when, when the team that usually loses starts to be the team that usually wins, I think that does a lot to wipe out the rivalry. And I think, like, if you look at Toronto and Buffalo, that's always been a rivalry, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. This year, or in the past couple of years, I kind of felt like that's gone away. There's been others, too. The Pittsburgh-Philadelphia rivalry will always be there, but it's not as, it doesn't feel as strong as it did no. a couple of years ago. Uh, I think Washington-Pittsburgh is still there. The game the other night, I don't know if you saw it, Jason, last night. Mm-hmm. No. It was it was pretty good. Uh, well, pretty good for Pittsburgh, not good, not good for Oh, Washington. it was tied 4-4 in the third. Yeah. You know, they were pretty close. Uh, some other rivalries around the league. I think there's there's a lot of new rivalries. Vegas has, has started some rivalries with teams. Uh, I, think, I think I think the California teams still have a pretty good rivalry. They seem to be like pretty oh, yeah. physical games. But to me, other than that, it seems like it's kind of been watered down a little bit. I don't know. If... And I think the schedule is part of that. It used to be that you played teams there were fewer teams so you play the other teams more often you had more of an opportunity to develop this negative or you know emotional chemistry mm-hmm. with the team and now you play rather than play another team eight times a year you might play them five times or even four because you have to play every other team at least once home and away and you'd never get a well not never but you it's harder to get a, a chance to develop a real rivalry with a team that's even your traditional rivalry because you don't play against them that often anymore mm-hmm. I, I think about I think about teams who've created rivalries. Uh, I'm thinking Calgary and Los Angeles because of the whole Kachuk Dowdy situation. I don't know if you guys remember what happened last year and some stuff mm-hmm. this year. I think that's it. Like, if Calgary's playing LA, I'm watching that game just so I can see that go on. And and uh, Calgary Anaheim as well because Calgary cannot win in California. They did it this year, yeah. thankfully, finally after 2,700 years. But yeah. Uh, I'm watching that game. So I enjoy the new rivalries, but yeah, I think I agree with your, like your original question was, is there, is there less rivalries in the NHL? I think, yeah, mm-hmm. there is definitely. And and that doesn't mean one can't start. Look at the Colorado Detroit rivalry that got going. Oh yes. You know, that was fantastic. That was one of the greatest ri- rivalries of all time. And who would have thought that Colorado and Detroit would have had that rivalry that they did. And it all it goes back vicious. to cer- certain plays like Wah fighting Vernon in the middle of the ice and Osgood and Everyone else. Well, I thought every goalie Detroit had there for about 15 years, I think. <laughs> yeah. Do you think the fact that fighting is down has contributed to that? Yes. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Like the, the, basically, the fourth line tough guys are non-existent now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I completely agree with that, yeah. Because mm-hmm. you see the George Peros is not in the game anymore, and uh, like Sean Avery's are kind of leaving. Like, these kind of fighting troublemakers aren't, aren't a part of the are not a part of hockey anymore because the EIHL, we just talked about it, mm-hmm. and that Matt Nickerson guy, he's not there to score goals. He's there to fight. His penalty minutes are through the roof. The NHL doesn't have anyone like that anymore who just is there to fight. And the fans, though, they still love these guys. I think it was the Toronto-Ottawa game last weekend where they Chris Neal was in the stands, and they stopped. They put a camera mm-hmm. on him and in, introduced him, and he waved, and they had him on the Jumbotron. Yeah. And he got a rousing 
uh, set of applause from the fans. They they really missed the guy. I could never stand him. Chris Neal, Sean Avery, guys like that drove me crazy. Yeah. But they are lightning rods for for emotion. Totally. And the same kind of emotion that drives rivalries. Mm -hmm. And there's like fighting is still a part of the NHL. But if you fight in the NHL now, you need to be able to play hockey too. Jamie Benn, one of the best players in the league, will fight anyone at any time. Mm -hmm. Nicholas Delorier is a great fighter. Look at him pr producing offensively now and stuff like. You can't just be a fighter in the in the NHL now. You need to be a fighter and a hockey player. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, I think that has a contributing factor. Yeah. Any other questions? No, uh, that's, I think I'm good. <laughs> Anything else for you to add? I don't think so, uh, Neil. I don't want us to forget the, our, when we do fishbowl, are we going to oh, do fishbowl? Right. And how do we, do, I can, is that an app or is it just a file? Because if it's a it. file, I can put it in my Chromebook. I'll do it to... Oh, I chose the fish. You want to choose the fish? Yeah, I better choose the fish. All right, you choose the fish. I'll, uh... Yeah, you can plug it in yours. I'll, uh... <laughs> I'll tap the fish on Jason. We right? have to do the fishbowl because Jason's original... Uh, <laughs> I can't believe the fishbowl started without me. What I are you doing? Here, give me that. You're breaking it. Yeah, how come it come out that way? I just pulled them apart. Because you're, you're old and don't know how to work things. <laughs> so you're having... There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Uh, so the fishbowl is uh, a project that we started a, c a couple of years ago, whatever. It's our first attempt at a YouTube channel. Anyways, so uh, you've got the fish. You're ready to go. So let's play the intro. Okay, so yeah, we're back. And the question is, uh, what is one place of the world you want to visit in the next five years and why? And Jason, I'm going to let you start this. Oh, come to me last. Please. Okay, Dad, you're up first. Oh, wow. Well, thanks. <laughs> One place in the next five years and why? Wow. I'm going to try to not make it hockey-related. There's all kinds of places I'd like to go that are hockey-related. Mm -hmm. but uh, All right, that'll, that, that's the mission then. Yeah. Can't be hockey-related. Okay. One place in the next five years. It would have to be, uh, not to narrow it down too finely, but it'd have to be Britain. Mm. Uh, I would love to go to Britain. And, and do some family research and see some of the sites. Uh, I'd want to spend some time in London. I'd want to spend some time in Durham and in Hampsterley and other places like that and up in Scotland near uh, in Moray where, where our original folks would have been from. You so just want to do the whole I want to do, tour. yeah. I think the best kind of vacation I could have around Britain would be one of those around Britain cruises where you get on a cruise ship and it just goes around in mm. seven days or 10 days and. You know, you put in in Dublin, you put in in Belfast, you put in in, in Edinburgh and Glasgow and Portsmouth and all kinds of places, and you spend two or three days here and two or three days there and take bus tours, and you never have to unpack. Okay. That's, yeah. uh, well, that's it. So that'd be if, interesting. That'd be you, fun. If you win the lotto, hook me up. <laughs> yeah, I'll get right on that. All right. You got anything, Jason? Do you want me to go? Well, uh, my wife would totally agree with Brent. Uh, the UK is number one on her list. Right on. Uh, for me, I've never been on a cruise, so that's what I would want to do Heck like that. Yeah. I wouldn't say the cruise is the number one destination I want to go to, but realistically, realistically speaking, if I was actually going to pay and go on a trip, that is more likely of something I would do and probably enjoy just cause I've never done it. Yeah. Uh, where like Caribbean, Alaskan, it would be a Caribbean one probably like I would love to do a Mediterranean stuff, but there's no way that's happening. Yeah. It's too expensive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, you've got a week coming up in April, I believe. <laughs> yeah, get right on that. Yeah. Two, two months. <laughs> get her done. Uh, for me, it's this is a tough one. I like I've always wanted to go to California and do the coastal drive mm -hmm. of all California. That's close to the top of my list. But at the same time, I've never been to Hawaii. I'd love to visit Hawaii. And probably like like Jason. Jason's never been on a cruise. I've been on four, and I love cruising. So I'd go back on a cruise. Like that's so Alaska. Like I I'd, I'd never done an Alaskan cruise. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, other I can't really make a decision. I'd probably say one of those three. Cool. Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah, good question. There's no name with that. It was submitted via email from someone that, an email that I can't pronounce. So <laughs> I just didn't put it on there. So <laughs> yeah, so thanks guys for joining me for this podcast. Appreciate it. Jason, you uh, you joining. Well, thanks for having me on here. It's going to be great. Good hockey conversations. Uh, good conversations about maple syrup as well. And uh, dad, thanks for joining as as usual. Glad to Thank be back. Thank you. All for watching or listening. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, I uh, hope you are subscribed. If you're not, hit the subscribe button. If you like this podcast, 
hit that like button. If you are listening on iTunes or Google Play Music or whatever podcatcher app you're listening through, uh, if you can leave us a review, that would be awesome. Uh, if you can't, no worries. As long as you're listening, that's the main thing. So thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. And we'll see you in podcast 35 on February 10th. I think. Yeah. Yeah. More or less. 10th or 11th. February 10th ish. Okay. See you guys later. Adios. <laughs>